Welcome everyone. My name is Keshet Roman. I am a reference librarian and the head of adult programming at the Irvington Public Library in Irvington, New York. With us today is Joshua Levin, who is going to be speaking to us on the subject of fair housing rights in Westchester County. Uh, Joshua, you're from the Human Rights Commission, is that correct? The Westchester County Human Rights Commission, that's correct. That's wonderful. Uh, just as a reminder to everyone, I will be muting the audio of all participants. If you do have a question that requires using your microphone, you can press the unmute button in the bottom left of your screen. I believe on some computers it might be in the upper left. Uh, otherwise, you can hold down the space bar to temporarily unmute. If you have a question and you don't feel like speaking aloud, you can also use the chat button. As I said earlier, it's the one that looks like a speech bubble in a comic strip. And I'll be keeping an eye on that as well. I'm going to mute myself and shut off my video to switch the focus over to Joshua for the time being, but I'll pop back on at the end. If anyone has any questions after the program, as I said, you can reach us at irvref at wlsmail.org or by leaving a voicemail on the library phone. Uh, that's at 914-591. Pardon me, I've just completely blanked on the last four digits. Uh, I'm just going to have to double check that. 914-591-7840. We will be closed today until Monday due to the holiday and due to some temporary staffing issues, but we will be able to check the voicemail bright and early on Tuesday morning if you do leave a message during that time. And without further ado or babble for myself, I'm going to switch things over to Joshua. Joshua, go ahead. Good morning. Thank you so much, Kashet. Thank you so very much to the Irvington Public Library for sponsoring this discussion today, to Kashet for um, helping to make this happen. Thank you all for attending this Saturday morning. It is so wonderful to see some of you here, uh, all of you, that is. Um, as Kashet had mentioned at the end of this discussion, we're going to open this up for a QA and a um, and I'll see if we can answer any particular questions that you do have, and you can always put those into the chat. For those of you who may be watching this as a recording, uh, the last slide of this presentation will have our contact information, so you can always feel free to reach out to us by email, by calling. Um, and when, one day when you can actually come to our office by stopping at our office, and we'd be happy to answer whatever questions that you may have. That being said, let me see if I can share my screen. All right. So again, welcome. My name is Joshua Levin. I am the Fair Housing Director for the Westchester County Human Rights Commission. I bring you greetings from our Executive Director, Teja Sinchala. Um, it, it is a pleasure to be having this discussion today. So. Unfortunately, um, even here in the 21st century in 2021, we are still plagued by the cancer that is housing discrimination. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. And we're gonna see if we can understand our rights and our obligations, depending on what our roles are, who's responsible for what, and kind of give you some sense of what the fair housing laws really mean. So what is fair housing? Fair housing in a nutshell, is really about just being able to live in the home of your choosing, finding the home of your choosing, being able to rent or purchase or get financing for the home of your choosing, or live in the home of your choosing um, free of any kind of discrimination. And we're going to talk about what that means as we, as we talk uh, today. When we talk about the fair housing laws, it's important to know that for us here in Westchester County, New York, there's really three different levels of law that pertain to us. At the federal level, there's the Federal Fair Housing Act. At the New York State level, there's the New York State Human Rights Law. And at the county level, there's the Westchester County Fair Housing Law. That's what we're gonna be focusing on today, the Westchester County Fair Housing Law. I'm gonna contrast it a little bit between the state law and the federal law, but for the most part, we're gonna be focusing on the county's law. And you'll find that um, what is protected in large part is the same. Who is protected varies a little bit, and we're going to be discussing that. So under the county law, uh, under the various laws, um, there's about 17 or so, 16, 17 protected classes, mean, meaning that you can't be treated differently because of one of those things. Some of those things we all understand. 
your race, your color, right? Your age, your religion. Some things uh, need a little bit more explaining, explaining rather. Disability, while most of us seem to understand what a disability is, we're gonna get into a little bit more into a discussion about that. Source of income, I'm going to explain that in just a moment. Gender covers not only your birth sex and your gender assignment and your gender identity, but also covers things like sexual harassment, which we can talk about more if you like. Um, your sexual orientation is covered under the county's law. Your alienage and citizenship status is protected from being discriminated against under the county law. New York State, neither the state nor the federal uh, law protects against citizenship status or alienage status. Your ethnicity, which between that and national origin, it also covers your ancestor and ancestry. So wherever your family may hail from, whether it's a generation ago and your first generation American or your seventh generation American. Your familial status, which pertains to the presence of children under the age of 18 and includes women who are pregnant. Your marital status, your national origin. Women, and I'm sorry, anyone who is a victim of domestic abuse, a uh, victim of sexual abuse uh, or victim of stalking, all are protected under our law. Now it's important to note, it's not just about what your protected class actually is. It's also about what somebody perceives you to be. So if somebody decides to uh, not sell you a home or doesn't want to rent to you because they perceive you to be um, Indian when you're not, or they think that you're a Buddhist and you're not, it's not a defense that you're not the thing that they thought they were discriminated against. Uh, so it's not just about who you are, it's who you are perceived to be that is protected based on any of these categories here. Source of income, as promised, under the county law, your source of income is protected, but it's not quite a common sense understanding of what source of income means. It doesn't mean that I work for ShopRite or I'm a lawyer and therefore you have to accept my money, right? Under the county's law, source of income protection means a protection against any lawful or verifiable income that comes from either a government source, like a grant or a subsidy. It's primarily about the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Most of you understand it as Section 8 but it's not just exclusively about that. It also would cover SSI, it would co cover mental health loans that you may get from the government, VA loans would all be protected, meaning that a housing provider could not simply say, I don't like that source of income, I don't wanna take programs, I'm not going to accept that. It is a protected source of income and to not uh, approve it or accept it would be discriminatory every bit as much as if they had said, I don't like Jewish people living here. All right. It also includes those grants or subsidies that may come from a private housing assistance organization. Under the county law, those are really all of the protected sources of income. It's a little bit different because the state recently also passed its own source of income. And under the state's law, much more is included. Um, they, have, they, all, they include things like child, um, uh, child care and alimony. Uh, also known as maintenance, and a number of other types of uh, sources of income. So just know that the state is much broader, covers a lot more, but under the county law, these are the types of sources of income that are in fact protected. Disability. Okay, most of us understand disability in the broadest sense, and we understand if somebody's in a wheelchair or uses a walker, has a seeing eye dog, they're disabled. But the definition under the various laws between the federal law, the state law, and our law, is really broad, right? Almost anything can qualify to be a disability if it substantially limits one or major one or more major life functions. Things like walking, talking, breathing, sleeping, eating, hearing, um, any kind of major life function like that. If it, if it's if it's a major life function and it's impaired in some way, it can be considered a disability. And it does not have to be a permanent disability. It can be a temporary disability, right? So. The takeaway here is the definition of, of disability is much broader than most people may, may understand. So who has to comply with the fair housing laws? Well, anybody that has really any nexus with housing. So your landlords, certainly. The property managers, absolutely. Building staff like your porters and your superintendents, sure, and the assistant superintendents, but real estate brokers and real estate agents, they have to. Mortgage lenders, um, you know, banks and such, where they're doing uh, more, uh, you know, HELOCs and, and, and lending out monies for other things associated with your home, like purchasing or renting. Um, housing authority staff. Advertising media, Facebook is susceptible to the fair housing laws. They actually come under scrutiny and under fire in recent years. Uh, Craigslist is subject. Your penny saver 
the New York Times, if they have a, a real estate section, all of those developers, contractors, architects, all of them, if they have some kind of nexus with housing, making sure that people can get housing or building housing, all of them have responsibilities under the various fair housing laws. So what's actually prohibited? What, what's not allowed? So in general, under these laws, um, you can't refuse to rent or sell or negotiate with somebody because they are one of those protected classes, right? You know, once upon a time, we had big signs saying, you know, no Irish and no Jews, uh, no Blacks, no Hispanics. Uh, today, we don't have as large the signs, but um, we, still, we still see this, uh, whether it's being expressed verbally or it's being um, published on a Craigslist ad or it's being um, implied, even if it's not explicitly said, but we understand that there's a reason that's really about some discriminatory reasons. So refusing to rent, sell, or negotiate because somebody belongs to one of those protected classes we discussed would be discriminatory. I'll give you some examples in just a little bit. Falsely stating that housing is unavailable. Um, just it, when an available home is in fact available for sale or for rent, uh, but making it clear to somebody that it's not available or suggesting to them that it's not because of one of those protected classes would be discriminatory. A number of years ago, I had a case of um, a white woman who went to an open house to purchase a home and the real estate broker was taking her around and took her upstairs and looking at the wonderful floors, you know, the wooden floors and the beautiful molding and how nice. And while she's giving the tour, the broker heard somebody come to the door downstairs. So she went and answered the door and at the door was a black man. And the man said, I'm here to, for the open house. And the broker said, oh, I'm sorry, but the house is actually off the market. Um, but perhaps if you call me another time, I'll find another place for you. Unfortunately for that broker, that black man was married to the white woman from upstairs. It was available for her. She was allowed to see it. It wasn't available for him. That would be a case of discrimination providing different terms or services or facilities, asking for um, an applicant to have an 800 credit score, whereas everyone else is permitted to have a 720 credit score, uh, making, uh, making sure that an applicant for purchase or rent um, has $50,000 cash in the bank where nobody else is required to have something like that, doing criminal background checks on one group as opposed to another group. Anything like that would be discriminatory. Uh, giving access to certain facilities, even after you're living there. Um, you know, only, only people who are living here under fair market rent are permitted to use these facilities on these hours. But if you are here under a housing choice voucher, you're not permitted to use those facilities at all. That would be a case of different treatment based on some protected class. Imposing different qualifications, fees or pricing. Right, advertising or making any statements, whether it's verbal or written or in, in an application that expresses a limitation or preference for, I'd rather have this kind of person, right? good Christians only, um, you know, gay couples need not apply. All of those things would be types of discriminatory statements uh, that may also evidence other forms of discrimination, but just the statement itself, the advertisement itself could be discriminated and could be a case of discrimination on its face. Some other examples, obviously, again, we, we see our, our signs and unfortunately these things were too prevalent and currently still are of not a section eight building, right? We want a, white tenants are a white community, no gays allowed, no children. Um, requiring a couple to move because they're having a child, right? Which would be familial status discrimination. There is a presumption under the New York state laws uh, and the federal law as well of two people per bedroom. It is a rebuttable presumption, which means that um, the landlord or whomever would have to prove that um, because of fire codes or building codes or what have you that you're not permitted to have more than two people in the bedroom uh, or you can't even have as many as two people in a bedroom and for our purposes even a studio apartment would be considered a one bedroom apartment so there should be sufficient for two people um, but sometimes even exceptions to that have to be made so understanding that you know forcing a family to leave because they have are having a child may be a discriminatory act Performing a criminal background check only on African American men, right? Which obviously would would implicate their race, their color, their ethnicity, even their sex. Um, evicting a white woman after learning her boyfriend is, is Hispanic. So again, it's not just about what your protected class is or what your perceived protected class is. It's people that you're associated with. 
Uh, in this case, if the woman was being evicted because her boyfriend is Hispanic, she's being impacted by a discriminatory act and she would have a claim. Uh, for that matter, the next door neighbor um, who, was, um, who has nothing to do with this couple, they'd be able to bring a claim because they were denied the opportunity to be living next to the Hispanic boyfriend and, and, and white woman, right? So there may be some claim that that neighbor may have. <clears throat> Refusing to communicate with a deaf applicant via sign language interpreter is a reasonable accommodation. And we're going to get much more into reasonable accommodations during our discussion today. Um, but a, a housing provider or a property manager may sometimes have to make exceptions to regular policies or practices or modify a physical structure in a common area um, space in order to give a person with a disability the um, use and enjoyment of a property that everyone else enjoys but just by tweaking things a little bit so that they are able to enjoy it in the same fashion. <clears throat> Refusing to consider an applicant's supplemental security income, all right? We were talking about that source of income and some sources of income like SSI would also implicate their disability. So saying, I don't want this source of income, they also then find themselves, uh, th those uh, people who are running afoul of that law may also be finding themselves uh, violating the law based on disability. And refusing a tenant's maintenance request because that tenant filed a fair housing complaint, which would be a case of a retaliation. And the various fair housing laws also protect against that very kind of thing. So retaliation, for all intents and purposes, would be another form of discrimination if that retaliation is based on some underlying discriminatory act. So if I file a complaint for discrimination or I, if I act as a witness in a case of, discrimin of discrimination and some adverse action is taken against me because I have complained about it or because I have been a witness about it or spoken about it or even complained to my landlord, even if I didn't file a complaint and some action is taken against me because of those types of complaints, that would be viol a violation of the fair housing laws. There are some exceptions under the fair housing laws. There are some exempt entities, uh, which we're not going to necessarily get into today, but I'm happy to answer those questions if anybody has. But I always like to just kind of uh, bring out that there is a type of housing known as senior housing. Many of you are aware of it. There's two types in New York. I don't know if there's any other types in any, any other state. Uh, but in general, there's two types here in New York. There's the 55 and older, older communities and 62 and older communities. Now, the difference between those is in the 62 and over communities, it means 62 and older. Meaning if my wife is 62 and I'm 61 and a half, I get to move in with my wife on my birthday. Seriously, 62 and older means 62 and older. You can't be, no exceptions. Everyone has to be of age. Now, 55 and older communities in general uh, simply means that in 80% of the units, at least one person in that unit has to be of age. Everyone else can be of any age. And then 20% of the units are usually set aside. There are exceptions to that. I won't get into it unless people want to have a discussion about that. But just know the difference between these two senior housings and know also that there are some other exemptions under the law, which we can always discuss later if you'd like. We are in some interesting times, as we all know, we are in a pandemic and unfortunately, even during these times, housing discrimination does not go away and they take vicious new forms. Uh, we have seen a rise in claims of sexual harassment across the nation, certainly here in New York and certainly in Westchester County of landlords and superintendents and other people in, in positions of power taking advantage of the situation of people being out of work or people being furloughed and offering tenants alternatives to paying rent. You know, there's other ways that, that maybe we can make this work. Uh, you're nice to me, I'm nice to you. Maybe you go on a date with me, maybe I come over when it's bedtime for the kids and you and I get to know each other. Things like that are on the rise. Those things are um, would be considered sexual harassment. And as I had noted before, sexual harassment would be a violative of the fair housing laws. That is absolutely the kind of thing that we can investigate and when necessary, we will prosecute. I'll talk about that in a little bit too. Um, but again, it's not just about um, your, what you are, it's also what you perceive to be. We have a number of healthcare providers, amazingly, as opposed to celebrating all their, uh, their hard work and going out there and trying to do what they can. Some communities, co-ops, condos, will tell their um, medical health professional community, we don't want you back in, we're afraid that you're going to be bringing the virus back here, right? So a perception that they are ill, 
like having the virus, it could be a perception that they have a disability and will spread that disability. Um, and that can be discriminatory, right? Same, same thing goes for if they assume that because somebody is Asian, Chinese or Japanese, and, and, and there's no end of, um, of harmful um, euphemisms that have been used. I'm sure all of you and I have heard most of them, but using terms like that, because you're afraid that somebody who's Asian may be more susceptible to the illness, um, to the virus, and maybe bringing it back and refusing to let them come home or rent or anything along those lines could be a discriminatory act. <clears throat> so let's talk about reasonable accommodations and reasonable modifications. And, and what I want you to take away from this, you don't necessarily have to remember all of it, but really what's when we're talking about when people with disabilities need um, accommodations or modifications or in order to, to live in a home, right? be it a co-op or a condo or a townhouse or what have you, or rental, um, it's really about what's reasonable under the circumstances. And what is reasonable under every circumstance is always going to be very fact specific. So what is reasonable for you? is not necessarily reasonable for me and so on and vice versa, right? So every single case of a person with a disability who needs an accommodation has to be examined for its own merits, right? It's not about giving people with disabilities anything they want because they're disabled, carte blanche, give it to them. It doesn't work that way. But it's not about just simply saying, we don't like that, I'm not gonna consider that, so sorry, you're not gonna get it. So let's delineate. Under the Westchester County law, a reasonable accommodation is a change or an exception or adjustment to a rule policy or practice, right? In order to well give that person an opportunity to use and enjoy the property like anybody else would. It also includes making a physical change to the structure if it's in common area space. So if you have to redraw the parking lot lines, if you need to automate the doors, if a ramp is needed for the main entrance leading from the outside into the main foyer, or um, leading from the lobby area up to the elevators. If there's a physical change of the structure, then the housing provider, co-op board, condo board would have to absorb the cost, the cost would be to them, and they would have to provide it if the situation is reasonable and demands it. And we're gonna get more into it in a moment. As opposed to when we're talking about reasonable modifications, which in, under the county's law, for the most part pertains to inside the unit. So if, if there's a physical change in the structure that's inside my unit, the cost is to me. I may still have to ask my landlord or my co-op board to be able to do that, but if it's reasonable because my disabilities require it, then they have to permit it at my own expense, and they may ask me to return the condition of the apartment back to what it was once I leave, uh, but they would have to permit me to do that. So some examples of reasonable accommodations. Being allowed to have an animal as a seeing eye dog, for example. We all understand if somebody is blind um, and has a seeing eye dog, and that all people who are blind do have seeing eye dogs, but if they do have a seeing eye dog, that that should be an exception to a policy that says no animals of any sort, or no animals larger than 10 pounds, or only cats, or whatever the policy may be. Um, includes also emotional support animals, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Helping a uh, person complete an application because they're legally blind, let's say. Transferring units, sometimes depending upon the circumstances, that may be an appropriate um, and allowable accommodation to move somebody from one, one unit or apartment to another. Uh, you'll see that often in, in public accommodations, housing, account, uh, housing um, right, public accommodations, like housing accommodations, excuse me, um, for public housing. Uh, changing or modifying a different policy or procedure, um, providing disability parking spaces, right? If somebody provides you with a, meaning the housing um, owner, the landlord, the co-op board with a disability tag and shows that there is a need, it may be very well a reasonable accommodation to give them a parking space, although there are some exceptions. So it's not always, and as I was saying, it's not always about, well, you gave it to that person, so you have to give it to this person. It doesn't work that way. You have to look at what the circumstances demand. So in parking, for example, uh, the example I always give is, let us say that you live in a community that has three parking spaces abutting the building, and you have 100 other parking spaces 200 feet away. And the three parking spaces that abut the building are assigned to people who have been there for 40 years, but none of them are disabled and they don't need those parking spaces as disability spaces. 
Now here you come with your disability tag and you're the first person to ever make that request. And you say, hey, I need one of those spaces closest to the door, my disability requires it. They are not allowed to ask you what your disability is. They're not allowed to ask you for a doctor's letter in that circumstance. And we're gonna talk more about what um, landlords and housing providers and managers are allowed to ask for. Uh, they're not allowed to probe over much. That disability tag is sufficient for them to understand that you have a disability, that the municipality, that the government has decided that you're su sufficiently disabled, that you need a parking space. And they will very well have to reassign that space to you. The closest space to the door can be assigned to you. Now let's say three more people come behind you and each one of them asks for the next space. Now for the next two people, because there are three spaces and you have one, for the next two people, they may be able to reassign those two spaces to two more people because they can remove the people who are there and put in people with disabilities and have that disability tag into that space. Now for the fourth person, it's no longer reasonable because there's no more spaces to be given away. Those three have already been assigned to people with disabilities. It is not the housing provider or co-op board's responsibility to triage and decide who's most disabled, who's more disabled. Is your gout worse than his MS? Is your Parkinson's worse than his uh, you know, steel plate in his hip? Not for them to decide. First come, first serve under the circumstances for the first, second, and third people, it was reasonable to give one of them a parking space because they had it available. Now for person number four, it is no longer available. The circumstances have changed, but that's not the end of the story. Housing providers have to engage in what's known as an interactive process. If it turns out that it's not reasonable, right? It would, it would um, cause a, a financial and administrative burden to the housing provider to try to provide that accommodation. They can't just simply say, oh, sorry, so sad, too bad, can't do it. They have to engage with the person and say, well, we can't do this but let's see what we can do and offer some alternatives. And maybe there's something else they can do. In this situation, they may be able to give the fourth person the next closest space, which is still 200 feet away, which is less than ideal, but they can give them the next closest space and put them on a waiting list. So when one of those three spaces uh, gets vacated, they're the next one up the list. Perhaps, perhaps they can redraw some lines and create the, a fourth space. Perhaps that is reasonable too. It's always going to be very dependent upon the circumstances. It's really the takeaway. Now, reasonable modifications as opposed to um, accommodations. Again, those can be a wheelchair ramp. Uh, it could be removing a, um, a bathtub and installing a wheelchair accessible shower, widening doorways, installing grab bars and bathrooms, lowering kitchen and bathroom counters, strobe lighting, any physical structure like that change um, could be reasonable given the circumstances. And as promised, um, the, the hottest button top always is when we're talking about animals. Now, as we had discussed before, when we talk about things like seeing eye dogs or hearing aid dogs, most people get that, right? When there's a, a clear and visible disability and there's a clear function of the animal, most people understand that that is a necessity and don't challenge it. Most, not all. And in fact, when there is a clear and visible disability, uh, and there's a clear nexus between the disability and the accommodation, like a seeing eye dog. A housing provider is not really permitted to ask for anything else beyond what uh, is being presented. The casual observer gets what the disability is. They understand what the need for the thing is. They don't get to probe anymore. It gets a little bit um, uh, different when the disabilities are invisible and there's not a clear need, or even if it's a visible need, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, a visible disability, but there's not a clear need of what the accommodation is. When we're talking about service animals, being a seeing eye a dog or seeing eye animal, I should say, because there are seeing eye Shetland ponies, uh, or hearing aid animals, or um, animals that have been trained to um, respond to epilepsy, seizures, or other disabilities, if it's reasonable, it must be permitted. And what can constitute a service animal and um, a, an assistance animal sometimes called or emotional support animal, it can be pretty diverse as you can see. It can be turkeys, it can be a boa constrictor, and it can be a parrot, right? It's, it's not gonna be too many wild animals, um, but it, it can certainly be a variety. Of, of animals, so long as, uh, as New York State permits it. 
and can be appropriate given the circumstances. There are cases of uh, autistic children only relating to a boa constrictor, um, which are permitted under New York state law, and I believe Westchester County law. Um, always check your municipality, always double check because your specific jurisdiction like New York City has certain restrictions. If you're in New York City that other cities or, or counties perhaps don't have the same restrictions. Um, but just know that if it's a wild animal, like we see, it probably won't be. But if it's some other reasonable type of animal, uh, it may very well be reasonable under the circumstances. Requests can be made verbally or in writing. It can be made through another person. It doesn't have to be made through the individual themselves. And as I was saying, the housing provider must engage in an interactive process if they need more information um, to verify that there is a disability. They, don't, they are not entitled to know what the disability is. They are not allowed to ask for HIPAA releases. They're not permitted to say that they need to know what the disability is. They need to understand that there is a disability how the disability is impacting you and what the function of the accommodation or the modification you're seeking is. If it's clear, end of story. If I'm in a wheelchair and I'm asking for a ramp to go up some stairs, they don't need to know that the nature of my disability is I took shrapnel when I was in Vietnam. They don't need to know that I have a club foot, which is why I'm in a wheelchair. They don't need to know that I got hit by a bus the other day and I'm paralyzed now from the waist down. None of that is necessary for the housing provider to be, to be alerted to. They can see that I'm in a wheelchair and there's a very clear nexus between my wheelchair and the need for the ramp to go over stairs. Nothing further needs to be submitted. I, I'm blind, I have a seeing eye dog. You don't get to ask for anything more. I have, I'm, I'm asking for a parking space. I have the disability tag. You don't need to know why I have the disability tag, all right? But if I'm in a wheelchair and I'm asking for a dog, well, those two, two things don't necessarily um, Aren't, aren't clear to the casual observer as to what the function of the dog is. Now, it could be that this dog has been specially trained because I'm in a wheelchair to go and open doors for me and you can reach things that I cannot. Perhaps this dog, uh, while I'm in a wheelchair, I also have uh, epilepsy and this dog has also been trained to deal with my seizures, right? So I don't necessarily have to explain what my disabilities are, but I do need to explain what the function of the animal is and how it's going to be assisting me so that the housing provider has the minimally invasive information so that they can understand that there is in fact a need for this thing that I'm asking for, right? Sometimes when we're talking about things like emotional support animals, that's where it really kind of, um, uh, most people get themselves in trouble when housing providers want doctor's letters and only an MD letter and on something like that. That doesn't, that, that's beyond the pale of what they get to ask for. Again, they get to ask for the minimally invasive information so that they can understand that there is a disability and there is a need that the disability requires this thing. Now, a doctor's letter may be best, but it's not the only thing that will suffice. Uh, so I'd like to say that if I need to drive myself down to Times Square, a Ferrari may be best. It's not the only way to get to Times Square, right? There are other ways to get to where I need to go. A letter from me or an explanation from me may be sufficient for me to explain the need for my emotional support animal. A letter from my mom, I use this as a tongue in cheek example, but my mom may be my, my, my healthcare provider. She may be in the best position to explain my need. So a letter from mommy may be sufficient. A letter from my therapist, a letter from my psychologist, my psychiatrist, it doesn't have to be an MD. So again, a doctor's letter may be something I may want to share, but it's not necessarily the only thing that will suffice. Um, so uh, under the, the, the federal law, uh, the last time the federal law was amended was back in 1988, if you can believe it. That's why the language of the federal law actually still refers to disability as handicap, although it's treated as one and the same. But under the Federal Fair Housing Act, um, there was a provision in that last amendment of 1988 that essentially said that from March, 1991 forward, any new construction for first occupancy that's designed and, and uh, constructed for first occupancy from that March date of 1991 forward, I forget the exact day, I should know that, but I lose it, um, has to have certain design and construction requirements built in. Prior to that, we weren't really thinking of people with disabilities. We weren't thinking of ramps and access ways. We weren't thinking about reachability or any of that. But any new construction, from that date, from March 1991 forward, if it doesn't have certain design and construction requirements built in, 
would be violating the fair housing laws. And that includes the county's law. Uh, we won't get into a full discussion about that today, that it is its own discussion, but I'm happy, happy to discuss that with anybody if you have questions. Westchester County has also passed um, an amendment to its own fair housing law several years ago. It's, it's known under the misnomer of the co-op disclosure law. So let's dispel with some of the misunderstandings first and explain what this law actually says or what this portion of the fair housing law actually says. So the co-op disclosure law or the, the amendment to the fair housing law does not require that cooperatives give a reason when they deny the application uh, for the purchase of shares. What it does say uh, is the following, that the cooperatives have to adhere to certain timeframes whenever an application to purchase cooperative shares has been submitted, right? Within 15 days of an applicant giving their application to a cooperative board for their consideration, the board has to either acknowledge that the application is complete or that there's some kind of defect and give the applicant an opportunity to resubmit the application. Once the application gets resubmitted, repeat as necessary. 15 days from receipt, either acknowledge that it's been completed, they're going to take a look at it, or there's a defect that has to be corrected. Once they've acknowledged that it is accepted and it's complete, the cooperative board has 60 days to reach a final decision, right, to either approve the applicant or to reject them. If they reject them, by whatever notice they reject them, a letter or email, whatever, whatever notice they send to the rejected candidate, Within 15 days, they have to send a copy to my office, to the Human Rights Commission, so that we have a record of that. If they fail to give my office a copy of that rejection notice, they are subject to fines. $1,000 for the first time they do it, $1,500 the second time they do it, and $2,000 every time thereafter. Right? That's what this provision of the law actually requires. As we were discussing before, there are other discriminatory acts like retaliation, which is against our law, threatening, harassing, interfering, coercing. Um, it's not just about keeping somebody out of the building. Once you're in there, if you're being threatened or harassed or coerced because you belong to one of those protected categories, that is all protected under the Fair Housing Laws, and this is something that you can bring a complaint on. Threatening to call ICE seems to be the um, most popular form of this in recent years, unfortunately. So threats to call ICE to intimidate somebody, uh, to keep quiet or to go away, that would be a discriminatory act that my office could investigate. <clears throat> so if one were to file a complaint with their office, this is what you can expect uh, for the most part. Once a complaint gets filed, we conduct an investigation. Now, our office is a neutral entity charged with doing the investigation of complaints of, of discrimination. We do not represent the complainants. We don't represent the respondents. Our job is to see if there's any legitimacy to what the complainants are alleging. So to that end, we interview all relevant witnesses, the complaints witnesses, the respondents witnesses, respondents being the people being complained about. We may identify our own witnesses, look at everyone's documentation, including our own, looking at whatever evidence we need to see, to see if there's any evidence that perhaps there's something discriminatory happening. While we're investigating, we're trying to see if we can conciliate and resolve the problem between the parties, because oftentimes that, that's best. If we're successful, that's good. If we're not successful, then once we conclude the investigation, we reach a determination and we decide whether there's enough there to warrant a hearing. If we don't think there's enough information, we dismiss it. If we do think that there's sufficient information to suggest that maybe something discriminatory is happening, we advance it to a hearing in front of an administrative law judge. And the judge will then have a full hearing, just like a trial that we're all familiar with, you know, taking a testimony, looking at documents, and at the conclusion, we'll reach a decision as to whether they think discrimination has occurred or not. And if they believe that discrimination, discriminatory conduct has occurred, can make whatever awards are permitted under the law. Under the county law, that can be compensatory damages, right, including money out of pocket and emotional distress and that kind of thing, punitive damages, attorney's fees, civil fines and penalties, those are monies that get awarded to the county, not to the person, awarding specific, uh, ordering specific performance, like build the ramp, let them have the dog, um, give them the, the apartment, that kind of thing. There, 
the complaints that get filed with our office have to have occurred within one year. It has to be filed within one year of the alleged discriminatory conduct, right? Anything beyond one year, there may be some other courses of action in court or some other agencies, but for our office to take it, it has to have occurred within one year. And for our office, the Westchester County Human Rights Commission, um, any act of discrimination would have had to have occurred in Westchester County. Outside of Westchester, New York, it could be filed with the state division. Outside of there, it could always be filed with the federal government. We are also seeing, obviously, um, a rise in xenophobia, hate incidences, don't, not necessarily things that rise to the level of crimes, but if uh, you are aware of any acts of, a, uh, of hate that aren't necessarily a hate crime, please call our office. If there's a hate crime, which I understand you may or may not be versed on, you can always contact the district attorney's office. Uh, if you're not really sure which it is, feel free to give our office a call and we'll, we'll, we will gladly direct you to where you will be best um, supported. And here, as promised, is our contact information. If you have any questions, concerns, a complaint uh, of, of your own, you want to forward our information, please give us a call. We're at 914-995-7710. Uh, our email address is there too. You can always email it to us. Our fax number is 914-995-7720. Uh, and I very much appreciate you uh, you listening to me for all this time. Let me see if I can open this up now for some questions, if anybody has. Feel free to either put it into the chat or take yourself off mute and ask. Okay, uh, Joshua, I actually have a question or two myself. Sure. Uh, but while we're waiting for other ones to come in, uh, you mentioned both emotional support animals and uh, what was the other term? Um, so I was saying service animals, assistance animals. The law actually doesn't define those, the fair housing law, does that mean? I, I mean, but that's what most people understand those terms to be. So I'll let you ask your question and then I'll kind of expound from there. So under the law, there's no distinction between those two? Correct. So actually the, the law, the fair housing law doesn't really mention dogs or animals at all. It, what it talks about is a, a reasonable accommodation, right? So it's important to not necessarily get too hung up on the labels when we're talking about things like emotional support animals or service animal or assistance animal. Most of us are familiar with the ADA and people hear about the ADA and they'll toss around the term ADA, ADA, ADA. The ADA refers to the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is a federal statute and that does not touch necessarily on housing, right? The ADA for the most part pertains to things like employment and public accommodations in certain other areas. But when talking about housing at the federal level, we're talking about the Federal Fair Housing Act at the state level, the New York State Human Rights Law, and at the county level, the Westchester County Fair Housing Law. Housing is different than, than places you work in public accommodations. So what may not be considered a, a reasonable accommodation in a public accommodation, for example, um, airplanes now are not allowing emotional support animals, is different when we're talking about where you live. Right? So even though the, law, though the law does not necessarily define what an animal, which animal is reasonable, again, the takeaway is what's reasonable under these circumstances? Is there a need? Does the disability require the thing? Because if the animal is a need, then the animal should, for all intents and purposes, be treated like a wheelchair for a person who requires it. It's not something that I want. It's something that I have to have. My disability requires that I have this thing be it the wheelchair or the emotional support pig or the seeing eye Shetland pony. Whatever the case is, my disability requires this thing. It's not just that I want it, I have to have it in order for me to function. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does, thank you. And I'll just give a moment if anyone else has any questions. As a reminder, you can hit the, hold down the space bar on your keyboard to unmute yourself temporarily. If you have a question for the chat, I'm keeping an eye on that as well. I'll just give a moment if anyone else has anything to say. And while we're waiting, I also just, I know I had mentioned before, if, if you're not sure, if you've witnessed a hate crime and you know for a fact it's a crime, obviously you can report it to the um, district attorney's office as I previously said, you can also report it to your local police department. If, it's, if you're not sure if it's a crime or if it's a hate incident, for example, somebody standing on the sign with a big sign saying, I hate all Jews. Right? That's not necessarily a crime, but it certainly seems like something that is upsetting the community. That would be the kind of thing that I would recommend that you call our office. And if you're not sure, either way, call us. Again, we'll, we're ha we'll happily give you the resources that we think that will be uh, better suited for your needs. 
Well, since we don't seem to have any other questions at the moment, I'll ask one other myself. Uh, years ago, my family was dependent on Section 8 housing to basically afford anywhere to live. Uh, we were beneath the poverty line and uh, I was employed less than part-time due to disability. We found that there were many places that were explicitly stating that they do not accept Section 8. Sure. Has, has the law regarding that changed? Are they required to accept that? Now, yeah, I, I, that that is what the the source of income is primarily the source of income provision, uh, the protected basis under the county's law is, is specifically uh, created to protect against. It's not exclusive to the housing choice voucher that's some, sometimes known as the Section Eight program. It's not exclusive to that, but it's primarily about that. I mean, the whole point of the program was to give people with this with these funds the opportunity to live in a home that, that they can afford with the, with the funds. And it's, um, it's counterproductive when housing providers would say something like, no, we don't wanna take that. So correct, so the county law now says, you can't say no to those programs. You have to accept it as a source of income, right? Every bit as much as if I was working as an attorney or a doctor, you'd have to consider that income um, as, as any other legitimate form of income would be. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Anyone who wants to speak up? This says that either everyone thinks that there's such a fantastic job, I've answered all questions, which I don't think is the case, <laughs> or some people may be camera shy, which is absolutely fine. Again, please call us, email us if you do have any questions or concerns. I'm always happy to answer your questions, as is the rest of our staff. I thank you all for joining us this Saturday morning. Uh, I thank again, Irvington Public Lab Library and Kishet for organizing this, for making this happen. Oh, I do have a question. So before I sign off, let's see what, what the question is. Does a building ha ha have a limit to the amount of Section 8 they can take? No, uh, again, I mean, there, there may be certain Section 8 requirements that I'm not familiar with. So just like in the case of the um, size limit per bedroom, that that may be subject to some building codes or fire codes. I can't tell you if, um, if the Housing Choice Voucher Program has a limit to how many people can be in a certain building. I don't know that. What I can tell you is that if a housing provider says that they don't want to take that source of income, that Housing Choice Voucher, Section 8, then that could very well be a discriminatory act. Notice I'm, I'm an attorney. I'm not going to conclusively say it, it definitely is, definitely is not. Uh, but for our purposes of a housing provider says we can't take any more programs. We don't want to take any more of those monies. That could very well be an act of discrimination. And I would encourage you to contact our office so we can explore that. All right. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, are there any other questions from the audience? Let's see. Okay, well, if there's nothing else, then I am going to say thank you to Joshua. Thank you to everyone in our audience for joining us. Uh, as I said before, we will be sharing this as a recording on our website via our YouTube channel. That should be posted by Tuesday morning. If anyone who was involved in this has any reason that they don't want that recording to be posted, please feel free to contact the library by email at irvref at wlsmail.org or by phone at 914-591, uh, I apologize, I blanked on those last four digits again, 591-7840, yes. Uh, so unless there's any last minute questions, I'm going to stop the recording and close the meeting. Joshua, thanks again. If you Thank have you folks. <laughs> all right. Be well. All right. You all have a great day.